Okay, let's see if the audio is working. Looks like it. Uh, I'm wondering if we may end up with a smaller group than, than usual even. Uh, I'm trying to remember how, ma how many of our group are uh, normally in the northeast here and uh, might not make it given the the snows and power losses that they've had up there. But uh, we'll, we'll give them a minute here and then, and then we'll get started. Well, why don't I go ahead and uh, and start rolling? There's always the uh, recording folks can fall back on if they start a little bit later here. Okay, so where we left this off is uh, we're still in the process of analyzing the data uh, that were from our our hands-on problem four, and we had gone through a, the basic Poisson model. Uh, and then a couple of models to deal with uh, over dispersion, uh, our Poisson gamma or negative binomial model, and the uh, Poisson log normal model. So, and I promised we were going to take a look at the uh, ZIT model as another option, uh, the zero inflated Poisson model. So, this is now going to be a model that instead of uh, instead of trying to model the dispersion in terms of uh, a more general continuous variation in the uh, in the mean count parameter in here instead is going to do a fairly simple discrete mixture uh, on that uh, on that mean count uh, instead in particular it's going to be a mixture of a model that puts all of the probability on a count of zero uh, and then all the rest of the probability on a uh, on a count that's distributed according to just a simple Poisson model so let's go ahead and bring that up for our example Okay, and I've actually got two representations here. Uh, I don't know if you saw the, uh, you should have gotten an email indicating that I had sent out a uh, revised handout for the course. Uh, and this slide, I believe, is the same in the revised version uh, as as the previous, but I've added another slide to to show sort of an alternate representation of this. But anyway, let me go ahead with this one. Uh, so this is one way you can represent a zero inflated Poisson model uh, where we've got uh, our, our number of coughs uh, in our ith individual here is going to be described by some sort of a model that I just called a zip here. So our zero inflated Poisson that has now instead of the single parameter in here being the product of lambda and t, it also has a second parameter that I've called pi. Uh, and the way I've written this is pi is essentially the probability that the uh, that the count uh, is a random variable from the simple Poisson model, and then one minus pi would be the probability that it's uh, that it's just identically zero. Okay, so so here down here I'm going to define that. And here you can see that mixture. So uh, actually, let's start on the right-hand side of it here. You can see I've taken that pi uh, and multiplied it by our standard Poisson density. Uh, actually, I shouldn't really call that a density. It's a probability function here. Uh, and so it's a Poisson where the parameter here is that product then of our lambda times t. So in other words, the average count in here. So, but then there's another component that I've written like this, where I've written it as 1 minus pi times uh, a Poisson where the parameter or mean count is 0. Now, in a sense, this is really just sort of a, uh, a shorthand uh, 
what I've really described here is, in this case, a uh, Poisson with a mean count of zero is actually equivalent to a really an indicator function uh, that that puts all of the probability on on time zero. So this function takes the value one when x equals zero, and it takes the value zero whenever x uh, is non-zero. So it's really more of an indicator function in this case. Uh, but fortunately, Winbugs let us de lets us define this style of a, a Poisson, which turns out to be handy in terms of writing the model in a nice sort of succinct way. Uh, another way of seeing this, instead of writing it out that way, is what I've written out down here. So I've broken this out into the two cases, the case where x equals zero, and the case where x is greater than zero. So our probability function then when x equals zero uh, is a combination of two components. There's a probability one minus pi that it is zero because it just comes from that excess number of zeros in here. And then there's the probability pi that it's simply zero because it, it just happened to be zero, a, a zero random value that comes out of the Poisson distribution. So in a sense, it's like there's two components uh, that could lead to an x of zero. Uh, and then for x greater than zero, our density function then equals the standard Poisson model multiplied by that pi in here. And I guess I never actually said anywhere in here, uh, but pi is is a probability and therefore is restricted to the range zero to one. Uh, and then finally, our lambda for the uh, sort of standard Poisson component here is the same as we've had it before. I wrote it as a plus uh, uh, b times dose. Now, this could have been more complicated because pi conceivably could also depend upon dose. Uh, maybe the, uh, you know, the probability of, of being zero will change beyond what is explained by just the lambda. Maybe the pi itself might change. Uh, and maybe the probability of being uh, a zero, uh, you know, might, um, might I guess it would, as you give the dose in this case, maybe it would actually uh, go down, for example. Uh, okay, and finally, we've got to put priors on everything. And for this example, I put weekly informative priors on everything. Uh, the uh, intercept and slope are the same as before. And then for our pi, I just put it on a uniform zero to one. Uh, and by saying this, I've also restricted its values to the range of 0 to 1. So that's one way of representing it. Um, I've, there's another way we could represent it. Actually, what do we got here? What do you get? i got a question from Dana or a comment. Uh, yeah, it says, where zip is, since zip is a mixture model, is pi the mixture fraction? Yeah, if we were talking about this in terms of the way... Uh, uh, the way non-mem kind of describes mixture models, yeah, I would call it a mixture fraction. Uh, let's see here. Oops, there we go. Another representation, and I write this one because this is actually uh, the way it's going to get represented in our bugs model, at least the way I've written it, uh, is I've got this alternative where uh, my uh, number of coughs, again, is going to be... Uh, well, I've written it a little bit different here, and it's now going to be Poisson. Uh, actually, the comma is slightly confusing. It uh, The comma is actually in the subscript here, so don't be confused by that. So it's just Poisson uh, with this lambda zip times time. So it's just got a single parameter in there, uh, and the lambda zip is now where I'm going to introduce the mixture. So I'm introducing the mixture sort of at a different step. Uh, where this lambda zip is going to be, uh, I've got this indicator variable for whether or not the um, the the model comes from, you know, whether or not our random variable comes from the Poisson model. So I just called it I Poisson times lambda I. And then I've got one minus I Poisson times zero. Uh, so, so I've basically got, again, this sort of combination uh, I've got the part where it's described by a Poisson where it's lambda i and a portion where it's zero. 
And so in the case where I Poisson equals, equals uh, which one do I want to say, equals zero, that means this first term would go away and only the second term remains, which in the second term is identically zero anyway. Uh, and that means that this lambda zip up here would be zero, so it would correspond to the Poisson of zero case. Uh, on the other hand, if I Poisson was one, then you have only the left-hand term and the right-hand term again still goes away uh, in here. So actually, I didn't even need to write the right-hand term. That was kind of redundant just to emphasize that in a sense there's two components. Uh, and in fact, this is the way we're going to write it inside WinBugs as you see it without that term because that's an unnecessary term. Uh, and this I Poisson, this indicator, is a Bernoulli random variable with our old friend pi again. Uh, so pi again is that probability. Uh, the I Poisson now is the indicator variable for whether or not uh, the uh, our count is going to come from the standard Poisson or, f or whether it's identically zero. Uh, this, by the way, I guess if we're talking uh, the non-MIM equivalent, this I think in non-MIM most people would code that as I-mix uh, inside that environment. Um, and finally, again, lambda I is just the, our straight line uh, in this instance, and our priors are just as we we showed in the previous slide. But this is going to be the form we're actually going to use inside uh, inside WinBugs. So keeping that in mind, let's uh, let's go ahead and open up uh, the WinBugs model. Uh, so that's inside our hands-on four folder, hands-on zip. Where to go here? Here we are. Dot txt. Okay, so here we are. Um, got our model, uh, got our loop going over all our patients, and again, we've only got one observation per patient. Uh, the first statement is pretty much just like it's been in all of our past models. It's just our NCOF is Poisson uh, with a quantity lambda t indexed by i. So that's basically equivalent to this first statement in the slides. Uh, then my lambda t is going to be our the i Poisson, the, so I just call it i p o i s uh, indicator variable here. So it's going to take values of 0, 1, and that's multiplying lambda times our t end. Let me get rid of that silly little m there, there we go, uh, times t end. So that's again what's equivalent to the uh, uh, to the lambda times ti here. Uh, and then, then our i Poisson is Bernoulli distributed with some probability p, so that's our that again is our, our mixture probability. So the, in this case, the p again is the probability of coming from the standard Poisson, and one minus p would be the probability of coming from that zero inflation component. Uh, and then f another way of thinking about it is one minus p would be, you know, is is also going to end up representing the fraction of excess zeros compared to a standard Poisson. Uh, and then finally, the lambda is just again our straight line, uh, and then our, you know, our usual priors down here. And again, as usual, I calculate a posterior prediction in here for some of our diagnostics and presentation plots here. So it's it's fairly simple trick in here. Uh, it's fortunate that when they uh, when they coded. Um, when, when they coded bugs, they allowed for the special case where, where the where uh, the parameter to the Poisson distribution is a zero. Let's see. It says what is equivalent with t end? Uh, oh, what's uh, you don't see it in the slides here. Well, t in this case, uh, t end here represents the 
uh, the endpoint of the uh, observation time in this case. And that's the way we, we had set this one up. So T in this case represents the, uh, the endpoint of the observation period. So we're talking about counting up the number of coughs from zero to TI in the sides, but the, what I called TI in the sides is T end in the, uh, uh, in the thing here. Uh, okay, so that's that's the basic trick here. So the zip is actually pretty easy to write uh, in here. Let's go ahead and pull up the R script. Um, uh, let's see. That's this guy here. Yeah, it's on zip four. Oops, maybe a little too big. Okay, let's see if anything uh, was unique about this. Not too much. You got the usual names up there. No, not really. There's not too much. Now this is it's actually almost identical in form to the ones we used for the other count model. So yeah, actually there's nothing unique to show you in that. So let's just show you the results. Um Go ahead and uh, run this before, of course. Uh, bring up the uh, summary parameters here. Uh, let's see. Go. We'll take a look at our effective end. Not too bad there. Um, you know, we might like to get these up closer to a thousand or so. So maybe if if I was really going for a production run, maybe I'd do maybe twice as many I had done this was three chains of 10,000 each maybe I'd do 20,000 or or something on that order um, that's actually as long as we're looking at the diagnostics around the uh, convergence and stuff let's go ahead and open up the plot so we can see what our uh, history plots look like and such Not too bad other than a couple of funny bits going on uh, that you can see down here uh, on both A and B. Um, so I don't know, again, if I was doing a production run, given some anomalies down there, I'm, I'm likely to do, you know, I might even push it a bit past just doubling it to increase the effective N. I might, you know, go for something more like 50 to 100,000, especially since it really doesn't take very long for this thing to run uh, in here um, let me go ahead and take a look at our here we've got our uh, our posterior marginals here one thing that I can you can quickly see here is the P again that's essentially the uh, that that's essentially the probability of the data coming from just the standard Poisson uh, versus being identically zero and you can see here it's centered oh I don't know somewhere around 78 percent or so in fact if we go back over to our table here what is that P yep uh, so you can see there it's roughly 78 uh, percent 0.78 roughly and oh uh, what is it cover here I guess we're going from roughly uh, 72 to 79 percent so looked at on the inverse that's basically saying that there's somewhere on the order of uh, 20 to 28 percent excess zeros uh, compared to just the standard Poisson uh, in this so that's the implication of that number uh, and then we've got our usual numbers in there for our linear model for our, our count as a function of dose uh, if we take a look at our fit in here, it's, you know, it's debatable whether that's, you know, you, you kind of wonder this tailing off at the end, whether that makes sense or not. But it's certainly picking up the general magnitude and uh, the dis difference in shape here could arguably be within the range of random variation. Uh, but if we take a look at our variance uh, for our number of coughing events, we see a picture very similar to what we saw with just the uh, with just the standard normal. I'm sorry, the standard Poisson. 
uh, it's, it's underestimating the variance. So if we actually go back and compare it to what we saw with just the standard Poisson, let me grab that real quick. Okay, if we compare them, we'll see that the um, the underestimation uh, for the zero inflated Poisson is not quite as bad as it is for the standard Poisson, but it's still pretty bad. Uh, so we've clearly got, you know, some, some some obvious model deficiencies here with the zero inflated Poisson. So, and if you recall, these were picked up reasonably well by both the... Uh, Poisson gamma and the uh, Poisson log normal. So those were clearly superior to this. Uh, also, let me show you what, uh, if we look at the distribution uh, for for these, the, both the model predicted and observed, again, we're looking at number of patients versus number of coughing events. And so the red curve here then would be our median, and then you got your... Uh, 90% prediction intervals about that uh, in here. What you you can see that zero inflation component on each one is a you know a little extra blip here right at zero, and as expected, the zero inflated Poisson does a pretty good job of picking up the zero point, but there's still some pretty significant systematic deviations from the observed data over a lot of these early portions where we have fairly high counts. It doesn't really do that good a job of picking it up compared to what we saw with the um, our negative binomial model. So yeah, so we've got at least some pretty clear graphical evidence that uh, that this is not the optimal model compared to one of those continuous mixture models that we were working with. Uh, and in fact, what we can do with this is, as we did before, uh, we can, <coughs> excuse me, we can you know, look at things like the uh, deviance and the deviance information criteria and also use that as a basis for comparison. And let me pull the slides back up here. Where'd they go? Okay, let me go ahead and... And this is summarizing those looking across all of these. Oh, by the way, the zip, I remember the last time I was showing you how you can get at the uh, this DIC uh, as well as this sort of uh, virtual number of parameters here, this PD term uh, in here. In the case of the zip file, uh, WinBugs is not able to calculate the DIC itself, but you can extract it from uh, from the the bugs fit object that the R to win bugs function returns, and that's where this came from. But this gives you a nice quantitative summary looking across our, our four models here. So we can start out with our Poisson model. You can see the expected deviance here. Uh, you know, not surprisingly, the, for a very simple model like that with no hierarchy to it, the PD is roughly equal to the number of actual parameters that are intercept and our slope. So you can see it's roughly two. Uh, and here's your DIC uh, value here. So that becomes our sort of our base comparator here. Uh, so for a negative binomial model, you see a big drop in the expected deviance. Uh, from that 1922. On the other hand, it's a more complex model, and we've got now that hierarchical model coming in from having the uh, gamma mixture uh, brought into this, and so the PD value goes way up. Uh, so it's almost 200 in this case, uh, but at, that's still um, well offset by the improved fit as seen by the deviance. So the DIC or deviance information criteria is still substantially smaller than the Poisson. So you get a clear winner uh, for the negative binomial. When we go to our Poisson log normal, uh, it's you know a little bit higher expected deviance, uh, also a little bit higher PD though on the you know pretty close. Uh, the net result is is that it's not, 
you know, that again, it's still markedly better than the standard Poisson, but it's uh, not quite as um, not quite as good, it appears, as the negative binomial, though, frankly, the distinction between those is not that strong. Uh, and then finally, for our zip model, uh, we do substantially improve on deviance, so that comes way down. But again, our this uh, PD value here is is high. In fact, it's higher than the continuous mixture models. Why? I'm not sure, but it is. Uh, and the net result is is the drop in DIC is a rather small one relative to the uh, standard Poisson model, and and clearly. Uh, clearly inferior to either of our continuous mixture models. Uh, so that's uh, so that was kind of our little exercise then comparing those and giving you some experience on uh, a collection of possible models that you can use. Um, now we didn't do this in the context of a mixed effects model but there's no reason why you can't use any of these within there. So for example, if we go back to our, you know, any one of our core models, you know, there, you know, if you had multiple observations per individual, let's say the counts were measured over different intervals, like the seizure example I had given before. Let's say you were looking at a, um, you're in a clinical trial for a drug to treat epilepsy, uh, you had maybe seizure counts on a daily or weekly basis over time. And uh, so you had multiple observations per individual. It might well make sense to have a, uh, a mixture model in there to account for inter-individual variability uh, in this underlying lambda. And that might be manifested as maybe inter-individual variation in the, the slope or intercept term, for example, uh, as part of this. Uh, or even in the, if in the case of our zip model, even in the uh, in the pi parameter here. Uh, anyway, so you, there's no reason why you couldn't incorporate any one of these four models within that context. Um, let me take a quick breath here, see if there's any examples, or I'm sorry, any questions. Okay, let's see, Dana, you're asking, is it possible to get correlations between estimated parameters and wind bugs by correlating the MCMC samples for the parameters? Uh, I may need to clarify which category of correlation we're talking about. Are you talking about correlation in the uncertainty or correlation in something like inter-individual variation? And maybe while you're thinking about that, I'll answer the question from the standpoint of correlation and the uncertainty. Uh, and certainly there there can be correlation and you can uh, quantify it. And uh, uh, okay, you said uncertainty. You, you can quantify it and visualize it. Um, trying to decide which is the best one to go after here. So uh, let me do a quick example here. Uh, let's pull up. Uh, let's see here. Uh, what have I got open? I've got the okay. I've got the zip, so we can do, we can use. Let's use that as the example here. Let's see. I got to open up an R session here. Okay. Let's move that over. Oh, it stinker shrunk it again. Okay, let's go ahead and just get our MCMC samples here so we've got something to show you here. Take a minute to get things working here. Also, as we're talking, uh, as, as this is running here, uh, near the end I was asked about the possibility of doing a zero inflated negative binomial or you know having zero inflation on one of the other models and it indicate that yes it was possible and after hemming and hawing a little bit I uh, I commented that uh, 
I might be able to do that for you today, and and I can. I did actually uh, put that together. It's actually, you know, the once I realized what I was doing with it, I realized it was actually a very simple modification of the um, of the Poisson gamma, or the negative binomial we had already done. Okay, so let's do it. Let me open up a graphics window here. Um, Uh, and so, for example, if I wanted to do a, let's pick our A and our B parameters, our slope and our uncertain, and our sorry, our slope and our intercept, for instance, I might want to understand something about correlation in that. So, I mean, there would be simple things like I could do. Um, actually, let's do the numerical one. Uh, let me make sure I'm remembering the right parameter here. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So, for example, I could do. Um, Posterior, okay, the, it's going to be called A. So I'm just pulling out the uh, the columns that contain the corresponding parameters that I want to see if there's a correlation. Here I'm just going to calculate just the standard correlation coefficient for that. So here I'm just passing the two vectors, which can, you know, which are those columns, and you can see in this instance is they're actually negatively correlated and actually fairly highly so. Uh, you know, we're getting about minus 0.86 in here. Uh, I could also do a simple plot. In fact, let's just grab. Mismatch parentheses. How can that? Oh, because I stuttered. Okay, and we get a visualization uh, of the thing, and again, you can you can visualize that correlation uh, quite well uh, as part of this. And if you really wanted to capture a broader full correlation matrix, uh, you could do that. You know, here just to keep it simple, let's just do it for our our three parameters here. Uh, so let's just take. Oops. Yeah, you know, what I did before, and um, what I'm going to do is actually do this slightly different here. I'm just going to pass uh, the three parameters that we're working with in here. What did we call it? Just P? I think so. I'll know soon enough. Okay, and you actually get a correlation matrix, for example, uh, on something like that. Uh, you know, and in fact, I could also have a little fun with that, and uh, instead of just looking at one pair of uh, parameters, like I did with the plot function, I could use the pairs uh, function in here. Oops, you know, and look at all the pairwise ones uh, in here so you can see it does A, B, and P and you can actually sort of visualize that between B and P there isn't a, a whole lot of stuff going on. Well P it doesn't seem to be much correlated with either one of them. Maybe a little hint of something with A but not much uh, whereas A and B are quite strongly correlated with each other. So so yeah there's ways of getting at that. Um, okay so okay, I was promising to show you the uh, the z sort of our our zip negative binomial, or I guess it would be a whatever. Uh, I guess that's a Zing model. I didn't even think of that. Z i ne yeah, no negative bin. No, it's a Zinb model. Okay, whatever. A Z i n b model, something like that, or a zip g maybe for a zip Poisson gamma. Let me close up some of this stuff. Uh, let me grab that, and okay. Actually, let's go back to the remind you. So again, this was what we did to do just the zip model, the zero inflated Poisson. So the main thing that was different in here are these two uh, rows right in here. Well, we can do pretty much the same thing again. Uh, in fact, I'll put it in this window here. Let's. Uh, Let 
go ahead and grab that. Uh, actually, I'll post this for you. I haven't, oops, I haven't posted this uh, uh, to you guys yet, but I just called it uh, ZIPG here. So it's hands on for ZIPG. Uh, and let's drag that over here. Okay, and you can see, let's we can sort of compare them side by side, in fact, here. So on the right-hand side is our zero inflated Poisson Gamma uh, in here. So the first part of the model is pretty much identical. I've got my NCOF is Poisson Lambda T. Lambda T is, again, same statement as before. It's this, uh, this indicator I Poisson times Lambda times T end. Uh, the I Poisson is Bernoulli there uh, and where the difference comes in is in the stuff right here that's specific to introducing the gamma distribution uh, as part of this so that we end up in the end with a zero inflated negative binomial by bringing in this gamma mixture uh, to define lambda uh, so so actually doing a zero infl inflated version of any of these models is actually pretty straight ahead uh, and in fact, I went ahead and ran that uh, to see what would happen. Uh, and let's go ahead and take a look at that. I recall I actually ended up running a fairly large number of uh, iterations on this to offset what looked initially like some convergence problems when I did uh, 10,000. I actually ended up overkilling and doing more than I needed because I ended up doing, I believe it was 100,000 uh, and throw, you know, just keeping every 50th. And you can see you got nice fuzzy caterpillars here. Uh, but perhaps the most notable thing in looking through through these, in fact, maybe it's better to look at it here, uh, is P. Uh, recall that we were looking at something that was, what, around 78.78 for the zero inflated Poisson. Well, now we've got something that's pushed pretty close up to 1. You can see the ma large majority of the probability is above 0.95, uh, which is another way of saying that the excess zeros in here are is a pretty small fraction uh, certainly less than five percent uh, according to this and if we look at the uh, parameter estimates here that'll reinforce that come on open up there we go See what I mean by overkill. This is the effective end, so you can see they're all in excess of 3,000 over here. So I probably didn't need to do quite so many. Um, anyway, so we've got that, but you can see here that our the P here is around 98%. So it's saying you know sort of you know around 2% excess zeros, uh, which means pretty much negligible. Uh, if we look at our things like our deviance in here. Uh, let's see. Actually, why don't we do? What do I want to do? I didn't want to do that. Let's go back. Let's actually pull up the corresponding R script. Let's just get rid of that for now. Uh, let's see, let's close that. There it is. Okay, let's go ahead and do run it so we can get at or sort of do a partial run at it since I didn't actually record the things like the uh, the DIC for this, but we can reconstitute it pretty quickly. Okay. 
Okay. Let's just grab this guy here. So let's take a look at our bugs dot fit dollar sign DIC. Uh, you can see that's about 1600. Um, let's go ahead and also get the PD while we're at it. And um, and our mean deviance. Okay, so let's go grab that. Let's see the our table so we can compare it to what we saw before. Okay, where did skim go? There it is. Okay, so here's a, remember here's our model comparison. So we had uh, so for our you know, our Poisson remember was. Uh, Actually, let's compare it to our negative binomial. So we had a mean deviance of 1201, uh, PD was 198, and the DIC was 1399. Well, you can see now we've got our our mean deviance is is a little bit smaller. You know, by small, you know, it's about 1195 compared to 1201. Uh, but our PD has jumped a lot. Uh, we went from 198 up to 403. Uh, and the co that and that was definitely more than offset that additional complexity more than offset the small improvement in fit. So the net result is that our deviance information criteria uh, jumps up to you know 1598, so about 1600 compared to about 1400. So the the negative binomial still is is the winner after we do that. Uh, but I guess the main point I was showing is that doing a zero inflation on any of these models is, is quite feasible and fairly easy, easy to implement inside WinBugs. Okay, let me take another breath here, see if there's any, any questions before we move on to our next major topic. We're going to move off of um, working with count data and start talking about time to event data. Okay, nothing popping up yet. If anybody's still typing, I'll keep my eyes open to see if something crops up here. Um, but but the, the next major topic then is talking about modeling of time to event data. And in particular, we'll start out talking about modeling time to a single event uh, per individual. Uh, so there's, and there's lots of examples of where that's encountered uh, in clinical pharmacology. Uh, and in clinical trials in particular. Uh, so first of all, I guess broadly speaking, just talking about time to event data, where, is, where might we encounter that? Well, in the, our single event case, you know, we might have, uh, you know, events that we would fall under the category of morbidity or mortality. So these would be things like time to death, time to a heart attack, time to stroke, or maybe in some in some M and M studies it would be time to the first one of these major uh, events. Uh, it could be time to drop out from a study. Uh, in fact, that's probably one of the most common places where I use these models uh, for the kinds of work we do. Uh, time to a thrombotic event. Uh, you know, uh, time to uh, time to bleeding. Uh, uh, you might also use it to in cases where maybe there are multiple events. You might you you might still only model the time to the first occurrence uh, of such multiple events. Uh, this, for example, might be time to some particular adverse event. Uh, in some cases, we may be talking about things that do uh, occur that may occur multiple times uh, during 
uh, during a study or some other observation period. So again, that could include adverse events, seizure events, vomiting events, uh, the occurrence of migraine, uh, dosing events in cases where you want to model uh, adherence. Uh, time to event modeling is sometimes appropriate uh, to deal with modeling of adherence. And I'm sure you could sit there and think of a lot of other cases. Anything where you've got something which can occur as a discrete event somewhere during during an observation period is fair game to uh, for time to event modeling. So now, one question that comes up is the one posed here, which is what makes time to event data odd in some sense, or maybe what I should say, what makes it different from the uh, kinds of continuous data that we may be used to modeling, you know, whether it be, you know, a plasma concentration or, you know, some sort of a uh, an efficacy measurement of some kind that you measure at a particular time. Well... Yeah, you know, and that's why I pose this as well. Time to event measurements are continuous data, so why don't we analyze them just like any other continuous pharmacodynamic measurement? And there's really two two main features that distinguish time to event data from uh, the most common PD measurements we use. One is that time to event data sets more often than not include sensor data, uh, and in particular, they tend to include right sensor data. Uh, and for those who may not have worked with that kind of data, what, what I mean by that is right censoring refers to the case where no event occurs in an individual during the period over which you observe them. So, uh, so as a result, when that happens in a given individual, then you don't have, in a sense, you don't have an observation for the time to an event. All you have is an observation for how long it went uh, without an event, uh, but that turns out to be inf informative uh, in some ways and something you want to consider in your modeling. So you don't know the time to a particular event, but what you do know is that the time, any time to an event in that individual would have to exceed the duration of the observation period. So in, you know, thinking in terms of, you know, a usual real line uh, where we're going from low values to high, we're thinking then of that means the, uh, the actual observation time, assuming it ever occurs, is somewhere to the right of the observation period we've seen, and it is commonly referred to as, as right censoring. Uh, so that's one of the key things that distinguish it. Uh, the other one is that time to event data are not observed at some pre-specified observation time. So that's that's a key element. And also related to this is that the time to an event doesn't just reflect the risk at the moment the event occurs. It, re it really reflects the history of risk of such an event occurring. Uh, over time, so, and that's what I'm saying here. So the, these events reflect the risk of an event over the entire observation period up to the time the event occurs, and not just the risk at the time of the event. So those, and as I suppose you could call those maybe actually two different things, so maybe I should say there's three features uh, in here that distinguish it. But they lead to having to view the problem somewhat differently than we do with most continuous data that we're analyzing. But the censoring by far is what makes it necessary uh, to resort to some particular special approaches. So what we're going to actually talk about as uh, the core methodologies here are what are commonly termed in the statistical literature uh, survival analysis methods. Uh, and there's actually quite a rich literature under, you know, under that name. So let's talk then about the principles and methods for survival analysis for modeling censored data. And we start out by just talking about, okay, uh, this, this thing that we call hazard, uh, which is a core concept inside survival analysis. So let's start out by, we'll define this capital T, that's going to be a random variable that represents the time to some event. And then little t is simply going to represent 
the elapsed time since some pre-specified starting event. Uh, so, and that starting event in the, most of the context we're going to be working with is going to be the start of a study. Uh, and then the basic idea is to model the probability distribution of this uppercase T as a function of various covariates. Uh, so then those covariates may be time, dose, pharmacologic response, patient characteristics, and so on. And that when we do those kinds of models for that probability distribution, uh, I, I would argue that they're most naturally conceptualized in terms of the hazard rate, or simply to call it the hazard. And let's formalize what that is. Uh, I guess, sort of speaking heuristically, hazard can be interpreted as the instantaneous probability density of an event occurring uh, given that the event has not yet occurred and so and when I say instantaneous probability density think of that as probability per unit time okay so it's an instantaneous probability density and in fact the mathematical uh, representation of that is very consistent with that notion so where we start out with for defining our hazard is start out just thinking in terms of the probability that some event, this capital T, occurs within a time interval uh, between T, this lowercase t, and T plus some delta T. So we're going to talk about the probability that the event has occurred within that interval given that it has not yet occurred. In other words, given that this capital T is greater than or equal to the beginning of that interval. So we start out with that probability. Then we divide it by the duration of the interval. So that's where we get this idea that it's sort of probability per unit time. And now drive the length of that interval to zero. So it's very much like the formal definition of a derivative in calculus. Uh, so you're going to drive that to zero, and the limiting value then is that thing that we call hazard. So again, it's like an instantaneous probability, uh, you know, probability density. So, and, and it's then going to be, you can think of it as being essentially proportional to the risk that an event will occur at a particular time, given that it has not yet occurred. Uh, and to make that quantity then operational, we have to think in terms of how that relates to uh, things like probability functions, probability densities, cumulative density or cumulative distribution functions, and so on. And this page is, is describing those relations. So one, one function commonly discussed in, uh, in the survival analysis literature is the survival function. And we'll just use the usual term for that, just the capital S. Uh, and that's simply the probability that the event time is greater than some particular time, or little t. And that relates to our, our hazard function according to this relationship. So we've got e to the minus uh, the integrated uh, hazard. So you take the hazard, integrate it from 0 up to that t. Um, Take that integral, raise it to, you know, raise it up in an exponential with our minus sign there. And that equals the probability that the, basically it's the probability that the event has not occurred yet. In other, or looked at another way, it's essentially the probability that, you know, that, that you've survived up until that time, uh, assuming T represents a, a measure of whether or not you're alive or something like that. But really, it's just, again, it's just the probability that the event has not occurred. Uh, we can flip that around and talk about the probability that the event has occurred uh, up to some time, little t. And that's simply our cumulative distribution function. And you can say I've written that as that's the probability that our that our event has occurred, or T is great, you know, capital T is less than or equal to little t. Uh, that's simply 1 minus the survival function, and the and then so we can write it here again as 1 minus e to the minus the 
integral of our of our hazard function. And then finally, if we want to talk about a probability density, that's just the derivative of our CDF. And we've written that right here. If you take the derivative, it ends up working out to simply the product of our hazard times our survival function. Those then become the, the building blocks then for when we're writing out the likelihood function for when we're dealing with time to event data. And in fact, that's the next slide, is then what does the likelihood function look like when you're dealing with time to event data? And what the likelihood function looks like for a given observation or a given individual depends upon whether or not you've actually measured the event time for that interval or not. And the three cases I mentioned here are the case where you've actually observed the event, you know, you know what time it occurred, in other words, or you, there may be a case where the event has not occurred up to uh, up to the time, up to your the period where you've uh, observed them. So we'd say there that's right censored. Another case that we sometimes encounter uh, is interval censoring, which would be the situation where uh, you know the event occurred, but all you know is that it occurred between uh, within some interval. Uh, th that can easily occur in a clinical trial, for example, where uh, a patient may come in, you know, come in at periodic visits. Uh, they'll come in at one visit and you'll ask whether a certain kind of event occurred and they'll say no. And then they'll come at the next visit and you'll ask and they'll say yes, but they may not ha be able to tell you exactly when it occurred. So at that point, you know that it occurred sometime between the current visit and the previous one, but you don't know where it occurred in that interval. So we would call that interval censored data. So, and this is what the likelihoods look for it. So let's start out with our likelihood for times of observed events. That's, uh, and I'm just using our P, T given theta to represent our likelihood. Well, in this case, that's simply going to be the probability density function for that time to event. And recall, that's just going to be the product of the hazard and the survival function. So that's what you would put in so, uh, put in for your likelihood there. Now if you have censored time to event, well if it's right censored, uh, now and again that just means it hasn't happened up to some particular time t, then our likelihood is going to simply be a probability statement. It's going to be a statement that of the probability that uh, that our that the event time has to be greater uh, than our observation period. So that's just going to be our survival function uh, for that case. And then finally, if it's interval censored data, where all you know it's happened sometime between some time t1 and time t2, then our likelihood is going to be the probability of that event. In other words, our time here, our, our event time, capital T, is somewhere between t1 and t2. Uh, and that can also be written as the difference between uh, the two CDF functions here. So we've got the CDF at T2 minus the CDF at T1. And that's also equivalent. You can also write that in terms of the survival function. So in that case, you flip uh, the order here. So it becomes the survival at T1 minus the survival at T2. So those make up your components, and of course, if you're writing, if you've now got time to events for several individuals, and each individual's observations are independent of the other individuals, then the overall likelihood is simply going to be the product of all of these uh, all of these likelihoods. So for that group of patients where you have an observed event, they'll they'll contribute a term like the first one. For those that haven't had an event. Uh, in the study, they're going to have a term like the second one, and for those where you run into maybe some interval censoring for whatever reason, it would be like the third one, and you'd end up with some product of some combination of all three of these, then making up your total likelihood. Okay, slide change. There we go. 
Uh, now the question is, is how do you implement this uh, when you're actually modeling? Uh, and we're f and it's fortunate that WinBugs provides you with a fairly simple trick for doing this uh, that doesn't require you to sort of elucidate uh, the specifics of those likelihoods uh, in here. If you're working in non-MEM, you actually do have to uh, sort of elucidate those individual types uh, within a pred function. Uh, WinBugs has a specific functionality for dealing with this kind of censoring. Uh, and as I comment here, right, left, and interval sensor data are easily handling in WinBugs uh, by modifying our likelihood function with this I modifier. So where you, it'll have I and in parentheses a, uh, an argument for a lower bound and an argument for an upper bound. And lower and upper in this modifier here uh, can be blank. Uh, in the case where it's blank, it means there's no limit. Uh, now let's make this a little firmer as to what that might mean. So let's take a, uh, a partial example here. Let's suppose that y i here is normally distributed with some mean mu i and some precision tau. And suppose that you, for a particular individual, for that ith individual, uh, y i is actually not observed. But but suppose that it lies between certain, you know that it lies between certain values. And I, as an example here, I give 5 and 10. So again, that could be something like, uh, you know, maybe somebody had some adverse event and all you know is it happened between the first visit and the second one. The first visit was at 5 weeks and the second was at 10 weeks. Uh, so that would be an example where you might encounter something like this. Uh, so we would say that that's interval censored. And the way you would describe that in WinBugs is your likelihood function here would look like this one. So yi would be normal, so our d norm, with a mean mu i, precision tau. And then I would and tack right onto that this modifier to our distribution, the i modifier, so that's a capital I there. Uh, and then I'd put a 5 and a 10. Uh, in addition, the actual data point, yi, again, we actually don't know the value. All we know is that it has to be somewhere between 5 and 10. So in the data set itself, the corresponding yi will be a missing value indicated by, the, by na uh, inside the data set. And what, when you do that, that's really equivalent to uh, this last likelihood function that you see right here for interval sensor data. It's the equivalent to doing that within WinBugs. Um, actually, it's probably worth also commenting here that this also is consistent with what you would want to do uh, with things like, um, you know, something I should mention is a, a common occurrence in pharmacokinetic data is a type of left censoring. Uh, and that's the case where you have data reported as BQL or BLQ, depending on which way you like your acronym. Um, so if if somebody's reported the data is below quantifiable levels and you know what the minimum quantifiable level is, uh, that would be left censored data because basically when you get a BQL uh, report, that means, okay, I don't know what the concentration is, but I know it's less than the quantifiable level. Uh, and you would, in fact, use the same technique inside WinBugs for describing that. Uh, another, and I should comment, since right censoring data is so common in, uh, in uh, time to event data, when you have right censoring, that's going to be indicated then by having only a lower bound uh, inside here, no upper bound. So let's say in, in this example where I said it lied between 5 and 10, let's, supply, let's say, well, no, all I know is that it had to be greater than 5 because I've observed them up to 5 weeks and no event occurred. In that case, you would simply leave a blank. You'd put 5, comma, and then nothing for the second argument. Okay, uh, let's see, I'm debating how far to go here. We've already kind of going over our supposedly allotted time here. Let's see, what's this leading to? Um, 
maybe I'll just go do this slide and I'll leave the example till uh, till Thursday. I'm actually not going to give you a hands-on example for Thursday. Uh, if you haven't already actually pounded through them yourself, it would be worth going through uh, uh, any in in sorry in example four since that was I had gave you four different models, so you might not have had a chance to do all of them. Uh, anyway, let me go ahead and do this slide here just to sort of fill in the conceptual material and then we'll break off. So uh, what I'm giving you is the special case where we have models where we have a constant hazard over our entire observation period. So if the hazard function's constant with respect to time, so I've just written that out as in other words when our h of t is just some h, some constant value, the relationships simplify a bit so those places where you saw integrals involving the hazard function before uh, become simpler than to write so for example our survival function here simply becomes e to the minus h times t uh, the cumulative distribution function becomes 1 minus that 1 minus e to the minus h t and our probability density function be just becomes h e to the minus h t and if you look at that, uh, you might recognize that what you're actually looking at then is this is the density function and this is the CDF function for a, an exponential distribution. So in this special case, then our time to event then is distributed according to an exponential distribution. Uh, and, that can, uh, and that knowledge then is another way to simplify uh, the way we actually express some of our models. And in fact, most of the models we're going to be looking at, we're going to be taking advantage of that relationship here. So I'm going to uh, stop talking for a second, see if there's any questions at this point, and then uh, rather than having a sort of lab session as we normally do for Thursday, I'll actually, uh, it'll be something more like a a lecture or maybe a cross between it since the next thing coming up I'll be doing uh, an example uh, to sort of set you up for doing your own examples. Okay so far nothing popping up there I'll leave it on here for a minute just to make sure I don't shut anybody off in middle t in the middle of typing here. Uh, so again yeah next time we'll, we'll start going through an example on time to event data. Uh, well, the other thing I should mention is I'm overdue to uh, post a midterm exam. I will try to have that by, I think I can get that wrapped up by Thursday and have that posted and we'll, uh, we'll set that forth probably so that I can get it posted and I'll give you at least a, uh, at least a week to, uh, to deal with that. And I forget what I had done in the past, whether it was one or two weeks, but at least a week to, to wrap that up. Uh, and for the midterm I'll, I'll just make it a, a multiple choice, sort of multiple choice and matching sort of exam. And I oh, and right now my plan is to just cover through, just through count data, I think, for that one. Okay, well, I think I'm going to go ahead and uh, head off to other things here uh, and look forward to talking to you again on Thursday. Bye for now.